Okay, so we have a goal to be able to classify all finite abelian groups of a given order. You tell me the order of the group, if it's abelian, I can tell you a full list of all the possible structures that that group can have. That's the power of the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. But anytime we're dealing with finite numbers, number theory sort of rears its ugly head. And so the first thing that we need, the key ingredient to understanding why the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups is true, is to understand why within a finite abelian groups, the primes don't talk. In other words, subgroups whose order is the power of a prime, if those primes, if I have two different subgroups and those primes are distinct, then those subgroups cannot overlap at all except at the identity and at the level of the whole group, I suppose. And so the primes don't talk theorem is the key ingredient to understanding why the fundamental theorem is true. In this video, let's get a view on what the primes don't talk theorem means and how we might be able to prove it. The first thing to know about the primes don't talk theorem is that it's what mathematicians call a structure theorem. What it's going to do is it's going to be able to tell me not just some important fact about a finite abelian group, but it's actually going to completely classify the structure of that group. So basic shape of the theorem is as follows. If we let G be a finite abelian group, any finite abelian group, the conclusion we're going to have out of this theorem is that G is an internal direct product. In other words, it tells me every finite abelian group has this internal times table structure that we talked about when we talked about direct products. Every single finite abelian group has it. Now, of course, every finite abelian group is going to have it in a trivial sense because every group is a times table with itself. Right? Just think about the subgroup, which is the whole group. Um, but if we can take the order of the group G and break it apart non-trivially into two factors, and one of those factors is a power of a prime, then this theorem is going to tell us something really important about the structure and how that prime power order subgroup not only exists, but interacts with the rest of the group. So this is the most important step on our journey towards the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, because it tells us every finite abelian group has subgroups from which it can be reconstructed. And that's exactly what we need in order to get to the fundamental theorem where we're going. So let me start by way of an example. Suppose I have a group G, which is abelian, and its order is 168. What can I say about the structure of this group? If it is indeed an internal direct product, then it will have this internal times table structure, where I'll have one subgroup, call it H, another subgroup, call it K. We need those subgroups to be normal inside of G, which, since G is abelian by hypothesis, we get automatically from any subgroup. Every subgroup will be normal. And we need them to intersect only at the identity. So the identity element is the only thing these two subgroups have in common. And then we would need to show that every element in G can be written uniquely as a product of something from H with something from K. Let's use the example of order 168 to fully kind of understand what the mechanism of this proof is. I'm not actually going to write the full proof, but I'm going to write it out for this special case and maybe you can see how to generalize it. So I'm going to define these groups in a very specific way. I'm going to take H and define it to be the subset of all elements inside my group that are eighth roots of the identity. In other words, all those elements whose eighth power is equal to E. Likewise, I'm going to define K as the set of all the 21st roots of E. Every element of the group, which when raised to the 21st power, gives me the identity. So that's how I'm going to define these two subsets. We're going to have to show that they're subgroups if we want them to go any further in this process. So first of all, we'll show that these are subgroups just using our friendly one-step subgroup test. So for example, if I have two eighth roots of the identity, x and y, that means that x to the eighth power and y to the eighth power are both equal to e. And by the one-step subgroup test, if I can show that x, y inverse also belongs to h, that will guarantee that h is a subgroup of g. Well, what do I know about x, y inverse? If I want to show that it belongs to h, I need to show that its eighth power is equal to the identity. So let's take the eighth power of xy inverse. Well, ordinarily this would be xy inverse, 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 xy inverse. And we wouldn't be able to simplify that, but we happen to know that g is an abelian group. And since g is an abelian group, this power can be distributed across this product without worrying about the order that might otherwise matter. And we get x to the eighth times y to the eighth inverse. But by assumption, x and y both belong to h, and therefore their eighth powers are equal to the identity. And the identity times the identity inverse is equal to the identity. 
Therefore, xy inverse belongs to h, and we've shown by the one-step subgroup test that h is a subgroup of g. The same logic shows why k is a subgroup of g. So I really can define a subgroup which consists of all the eighth roots of the identity, and another subgroup that consists of all the 21st roots of the identity, and those really are subgroups. And since g is abelian, those are also automatically normal subgroups as well. So I have two normal subgroups. Now, I want to show that the only thing these subgroups have in common is the identity element. In other words, there can be no element of g which is both an eighth root of the identity and a 21st root of the identity, except for the identity element itself. So let's do that. Let's assume that x is an element that belongs to the intersection of these two subgroups. So it's both an eighth root of the identity and a 21st root of the identity. Then what can we say? Well, x to the eighth and x to the 21st are both going to be equal to e. Right, by assumption. But if x to the eighth power is equal to the identity, that must mean that the order of x is a divisor of eight. That's the old classic theorem about how once I raise uh, an element to a certain power and get the identity, the order of that element has to be a factor of that power. Therefore, the order of x is a factor of eight, according to the first equality. But the order of x must be a factor of 21, according to the second. Right? Another way to see that is all the elements in H are going to have orders which are factors of 8. All the elements of K are going to have orders that are factors of 21. So if I have an element that's in both of these subgroups, its order must divide 8 and 21. The problem is 8 and 21 don't have any interesting common factors, except for 1. Therefore, the order of X must be equal to 1, and therefore X must be equal to the identity element, because that's the only element that has order 1 inside of a group. Therefore, my eighth roots of the identity and my 21st roots of the identity only share the identity element in common. There's nothing else that can be both an eighth root and a 21st root. So now we're getting much closer to showing that G is indeed a direct product of H and K. We have two normal subgroups. They only intersect at the identity. So now we have to do the product bit. We have to show why any element in my group can be written as a product of an element from H and an element from K. If I can do that, then we're done. We've shown that G is a direct product of H and K. And here's the key. We need the Euclidean algorithm to tell me why I can take the number 8 and the number 21 and write an integer linear combination of those two and get the number 1 at the end of the process. And the Euclidean algorithm can find that for us, guarantee that that exists for us, because 1 is the greatest common divisor of 8 and 21. So this linear Diophantine equation has a solution over the integers. And that's great news. In particular, the solution for 8 and 21 is 8 times 34 plus 21 times negative 13. So that's an example of a solution to that linear Diophantine equation. And that is going to help us show why this g is the product of something from h with something from k. Because after all, g to the power 1 is going to be equal to g to the power 8 times 34 plus 21 times negative 13. But now what I've done is I've found out that I can break apart g into two bits, a bit which is g to the power 8 times 34, and another bit which is g to the power 21 times negative 13. And those two elements are respectively elements of k and elements of h. So my claim here is that g to the power 8 times 34 is a 21st root of the identity, and g to the power 21 times negative 13 is an eighth root of the identity. Why is that the case? Well, take a look. So g to the power 21 to the power minus 13 is an eighth root of the identity, because when I raise that to the eighth power, I'm going to get g to the 21 times 8 times negative 13. That's g to the negative 13 raised to the power 168. But 168 is the order of my whole group, and one of the corollaries to Lagrange's theorem says that for any finite group, if I raise any element to the order equal to the order of the group, I'm always guaranteed to get the identity. Another way to say that is in a group of order 168, every single element in the group is a 168th root of the identity. And therefore, when I raise g to the 21 to the minus 13 to the 8th, I get a 168th power of an element of g, and therefore that must be the identity. And therefore, g to the 21 times minus 13 is an eighth root of the identity, and so it belongs to h.
The very same logic applies to g to the 8 times 34. When I raise it to the 21st power, that 21 and this 8 are going to combine together to give me 168, and I again get a 168th power of the element g to the 34, and that 168th power has to be the identity as well. Therefore, g to the 8 times 34 belongs to k. And there you have it. So we've shown now that every element in my group can be written as a product of some eighth root of the identity with some 21st root of the identity. And since those eighth roots and 21st roots respectively form two normal subgroups whose intersection consists only of the identity element, that means that we have just proven that this is in fact a internal direct product of H with K. So we've now won the product structure, but we want to get one more bite at this apple before we wrap up this primes don't talk theorem. We'd also like to be able to say something about the orders of the groups, subgroups, H and K. If I can say how many eighth roots of the identity there are, or how many 21st roots of the identity there are, that seems like it's an even more useful sort of concrete structural fact about my group that's going to help us in the end. And what we'd like to be true is we'd like for there to be a total of eight eighth roots of the identity and a total of 21 21st roots of the identity. That would be fantastic. And in fact, turns out to be true. Let's see why. Why are there eight eighth roots of the identity element in my group G? Well, we already know, now that we know that G is an internal direct product of H and K, we know that the order of G is going to be equal to the product of the order of H and the order of K. So we just know that when I multiply the orders of these two subgroups together, I know I get 168. I don't know that each of them are respectively equal to 8 and 21. Yet. So in order to believe that, I'm going to convince you that the order of k, the number of 21st roots, must be equal to 21. And the way I'm going to do that is by convincing you that there's no way for the order of k to be even. If the order of k were even, it would be able to absorb one of the powers of the prime 2 from this potential order of h, and that would scuttle the fact that there could be eighth, eight eighth roots of the identity. So I want to show that that prime whose power characterizes the order of h cannot divide the order of k. In this case, that prime is 2. So how do I know the order of k is not even? Well, if it were, so if 2 did divide the order of k, then that must mean, according to Cauchy's theorem, that there would exist an element of order 2 inside of that subgroup. But what's the problem there? If I had an element of order 2 that were somehow a 21st root of the identity, I would arrive at a contradiction, because all the 21st roots of the identity will have orders that divide 21. But 2 does not divide 21. Therefore, I can't have an even order for k, because it would guarantee an element of order 2, which can't exist because all the orders of elements in that subgroup have to divide 21. Therefore, the order of k cannot have a factor of 2 in it, so all the factors of 2 must belong in this product to the order of h, and therefore the order of k must be 21, and the order of h must be 8. So this is the result that, when you generalize it, gives you the full flourish of the primes don't talk theorem. And here's the statement in its totality. If g is a finite abelian group and I can factor the order of my group into p to the k times m, so I peel off all the prime powers of p and the leftovers, the m, don't have any more powers of p in them. So in this case, the role of p was played by 2 uh, and the role of m was played by 21, right? so 2 doesn't divide 21. Then the conclusion of the theorem is that there exist these subgroups, all of the p to the kth roots of the identity and all of the mth roots of the identity. And those together form the internal direct product and furthermore, that the orders of these subgroups are what we would want them to be. The order of the subgroup H is, in fact, P to the K. There are P to the K, P to the Kth roots. And the order of the subgroup K is indeed M. To wrap this up, I just want to illustrate how this theorem helps us to actually completely break down the order of a finite abelian group. The schema goes something like this. We start off with a group that has 168 elements that's abelian, and its structure is completely undifferentiated when we first meet it. But, since I know that 168 is 2 to the power 3 times 21, one application of the primes don't talk theorem lets us do what we did uh, a minute ago and identify a subgroup of order 8 and a subgroup of order 21 such that G is the internal direct product of those two subgroups. 
So this already helps me to kind of break my 168 elements into this 8 by 21 table of elements, internal times table for G. But the next thing we notice is that while we can't say anything else about the structure of this subgroup of order 8, the subgroup of order 21, on the other hand, its order is composite, it's made up of different primes, and so we could continue the process. We could apply the same primes don't talk theorem to the subgroup of order 21, which is equal to 3 times 7, and be able to say that that subgroup will have subgroups of its own of orders respectively 3 and 7 that make k an internal direct product of two of its subgroups, which are then therefore subgroups of the larger group G. And so what we get at the end of the day for this group of order 128 is the reassurance that this group is an internal direct product of three factors. Some group H whose order is 8, another group M whose order is 7, and another group L whose order is 3. So a complete prime factorization of the order of my group will tell me exactly the direct product structure that this group must have, according to the primes don't talk theorem. And that's the real power of what's going on here. We know for sure every group of 168 order is going to be a direct product of something of order 8 with something of order 3 with something of order 7. And that's a huge win in our process toward classifying all finite abelian groups. The only question that it doesn't answer is it doesn't answer what the possible structures of each of these factors in the direct product may be. So what can these building block prime power order groups actually look like? And that's the next step that we have to get to, which is the prime powers partition theorem.